I was honored to be asked to be with you all this evening, but <clears throat> to tell you the truth, since I spent 22 years as a Washington lawyer and then some time out at the CIA in the Clinton administration, I'm actually honored to be invited into any polite company for any purpose <laughs> at all. <laughs> Let's um, get rid of one subject right away because it always comes up and uh, rather than wait till the question and answer period, I may as well deal with it and it especially comes up of course in these days and times, which is the question, did you ever participate in any of those, you know, covert operations? And the answer is, yeah, I did once. And, um, you know, this is a uh, small and uh, discreet audience. I, I think I could uh, probably, especially in these days and times, uh, talk a little bit about it. <clears throat> it happened um, because my wife and I were classmates at Stanford, and in the fall of 93, uh, just uh, uh, on our 30th anniversary at Stanford, or classmates at graduation, we decided that we would get away from these two crazy jobs we had, me at the CIA as the chief operating officer, the manager essentially of the National Academy of Sciences, and that we'd take three or four days off, go out to see uh, a homecoming game, see old friends, uh, have a good time. And the first thing that happened is my head of security at the CIA came in to see me and he said, uh, Mr. Director, uh, I know uh, Mrs. Woolsey's going uh, with you out to uh, your reunion, but he, he said, you know, you really, um, I got to tell you, uh, we can't have anybody named Woolsey on your plane. I said, but my name's Woolsey. And he said, oh, no, sir, uh, you're going to need to fly in alias. And, of course, my first thought was, uh-oh, there go the frequent flyer upgrades. <laughs> so we go out to Dulles Airport, and we take my wife to a United flight, and sitting in first class with her nice upgrade, seat, sipping a glass of Chardonnay, her plane takes off for San Francisco. We go to another United flight, just down the ramp a bit, and um, pilot and the, the, uh, my two security guys stop by the pilot and talk for a moment to him and the flight attendant, and we go back to, unfortunately, the back row uh, of coach. Now, with this audience, maybe I should explain something. There's a section in the plane behind first class. We know. You know. We all know. I was told this audience. Never mind. So we take me onto the plane, the two security men do. And having already spoken to the pilot and chief flight attendant, we go back to the back row of coach. And these are two big guys being security guys, and so they're sitting on one on each side of me. I'm in that seat in the middle where you can't even lean back because there's a barrier behind you, the John, and uh, I'm wedged in between these two giant guys for five, six hours to San Francisco. Well, we finally get to San Francisco, and as I'm walking down the jetway, a flight attendant comes over to one of my... Uh, security guys, whose nickname, for about five different reasons, is Rock. Now, I had not seen Rock even smile in the six months he'd been on my security detail. But as the flight attendant walks past him and whispers something to him as we're walking down the jetway, he just cracks up. And since I had not seen Rock even smile in those six months to, to seem laugh boisterously was a surprise. So as we walked past, I said, Rock, um, what's so funny? He said, well, <laughs> that's what she said. I said, what'd she say? He said, she said, um, you know, I've been on these flights for 20 years, and that is the politest and best behaved prisoner that we have ever had. <laughs> so the way I looked at it, by that time having been in the CIA for six months, I had a covert operation. I had to get to California undercover. I got there undercover. Mission accomplished. <laughs> well, um, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about a, a subject that 
is not pleasant, but uh, sometimes those things we have to deal with uh, in the world are not. And uh, let me leave plenty of time for, for questions and hit the, the high points uh, here. But um, the thing that I want to emphasize is that this country has 18 critical infrastructures, food, water, transportation, finance, communications, all of them, without exception, depend almost completely on the 18th infrastructure, namely electricity, in order to operate. So if the grid goes down for a day or two and you've got to go to your backup uh, generator at your house and uh, everybody uh, sits around and puts logs on the fire instead of having uh, every, all the systems going, eh, that's not bad and it's actually kind of fun. But after four or five or six or seven days, it gets to be a serious problem. You need to think about what it would be like if it went on for months, veering into years. Because uh, the electric grid is unfortunately uh, extremely fragile. Now, the National Academy of Engineering uh, said uh, a uh, a couple of years ago that it was the most remarkable invention uh, of the 20th century. In a sense, they're right. It is amazing that we can, just by plugging something in here, be getting uh, electricity from Maine or Canada or wherever, and it all works, and you get plug it in, turn the switch. Uh, uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, but um, it is as the Academy said, remarkable, but it is also remarkably fragile. And it is more and more fragile all along, really because of Moore's Law in part, because we are so interconnected in every way that you can think. There are a lot of things that can go wrong and go not just a little bit wrong, not just log on the fire instead of having the electricity on in the house for an evening fun, but disastrous. And that um, world that conceivably we or other countries might have to live in briefly um, in the event of some disaster occurring for the electric grid is what I want to talk to you uh, about for at least uh, a few minutes here. Um, the problem is that uh, Tesla won over Edison. And we got alternating current instead of direct current. Probably a good decision at the time, but it's unfortunate in a way it didn't go the other direction. But with alternating current, we have to step up the voltage in order to transmit electricity a long distance. And then we step it down again, and that's done with transformers. And transformers are the heart of our electric grid for the country. Nothing works without the transformers working. Nothing. And as a result, we live in a situation in which if a transformer is broken or damaged intentionally or otherwise, and we'll get to Metcalf, California in just a moment, if a transformer is broken or damaged, to replace it, if it's seriously damaged, is a matter of probably at least a year and a half, more likely a couple of three years. Uh, there are very few spares, not nearly enough are stored. There's been very little work on research and development to figure out how to make transformers somewhat more modular so they could, if you have a spare and this one has been destroyed, you can replace this one with the spare. For extremely high voltage transformers, big ones that are the heart of the system, that's uh, very difficult, almost impossible to do. Each transformer fits into its own slot. It is not fungible. And uh, what that means is that once 
the grid is down, uh, you have a extremely dangerous and difficult situation. Take uh, what happened at Metcalf. I don't know uh, if uh, you've all seen the uh, pieces in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times over the course of the last uh, uh, week or so. There's going to be another uh, television special on this uh, coming up in about a week. Um, essentially, uh, the around 2 o'clock in the morning last April 16th, a uh, group of about half a dozen young men, masks or ski masks, hard to tell who they were, uh, pulled in in an SUV to the uh, transformer complex in Metcalf, California, very near San Jose, and in a very disciplined fashion, the men got out of the SUV. Uh, took some equipment that they had in the SUV that would lift things that were very heavy, lifted a 250 plus pound manhole cover uh, off the wires that uh, were buried near where the transformers were, went down two of them into the manhole cover, cut the wires that would have uh, uh, given any uh, 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 warning uh, from a, a, a malfunction or, or lack of heat, uh, lack of operation of the whole electrical system. Um, left lookouts to see who might, uh, uh, anybody who might be coming that they could get warning for, um, and uh, cut the 911 uh, uh, lines underground, uh, climbed back up, went to each of them to a set of stones that had been placed where the transformers were the easiest to shoot at. And with a few minutes of shooting, took out 17 of the 20 transformers with sniper fire. Um, a apparent, apparent drive-by by a car that had heard something um, as soon as the out look, lookout saw what was happening, he signaled the others. Everybody piled into the uh, SUV, uh, away before the other car got there, and the other car didn't know what was happening and didn't know what the gunfire had been, been about. Left some six or seven hours later, about five o'clock in the morning, PG&E finally uh, sent group of electrical specialists to look at what was going on and they found that uh, sniper bullet fire in all of the transformers except two uh, and them leaking a lot of oil and the electric systems in Silicon Valley more or less all in the process of going down. Uh, this got itself sorted out uh, in terms of repairing the transformers after a couple or three or four months worth of work. But the local authorities all said it had been hooliganism. Everybody except the uh, sheriff of the county. She was the one who called it straight all the way. Um, and uh, it uh, uh, clearly to her and to one or two of the former Navy SEALs who went with PG&E to look at it said this was uh, no uh, uh, caper of a bunch of young guys with their father's hunting rifles uh, having some target practice with some beer in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, this was a very serious effort to take down the grid, at least that portion of it. There are two other transformer farms essentially in Northern California, one in the East Bay, uh, one uh, down nearer to Palo Alto. If all three of those had been tra taken out, uh, uh, basically you would have been without electricity in Northern California for a year and a half, two years, something along those lines. Uh, happily, the, those who fired into the transformers were not using armor-piercing uh, rounds, so they took out the fans and uh, some of the apparatus, but not, didn't completely destroy the transformers itself, themselves. Um, and they um, um, 
uh, were able to repair it sooner than they would have if the uh, attackers had done it just right. So uh, the reaction of Washington to this, and I had a hand in taking the former chairman of Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, John Wellinghoff, who's now a lawyer in Northern California, um, taking him around to people in the Pentagon and so forth to get somebody to focus on this, um, it, it took us a long time. It took a number of months before uh, uh, finally someone was willing to say, you know, this might be more than vandalism. Uh, and uh, uh, to actually, uh, through finally talking to a bunch of people and so on, seeing uh, this crop up in the press and now page Wall Street Journal, etc. Um, what's interesting here is how primitive the uh, attack was, although it was sophisticated in the sense of being carefully planned. Uh, taking out transformers just by firing sniper rounds uh, into them is one way to do it, but there are a lot of others. Obviously cyber. Um, obviously, uh, I think a general approach toward going after the electric grid in, a, in sophisticated fashions that could have left a major share of the United States uh, in economic uh, disaster. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we have 18 critical infrastructures, 17 of them depend on the 18th electricity, and uh, uh, you're down for a couple of years probably if they shot right. Um, what is potentially going on here and what else might happen? Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's hard to say exactly. Nobody knows who these men were. Uh, FBI has no suspects as far as I know. Um, this is not a regional threat of a disaster that can be somewhat circumscribed. Hurricanes tend not to happen in the Pacific Northwest and in other parts of the country. So if you are into hurricane protection, you at least have some feel for what parts of the country and so forth might be most uh, damaged by such a phenomenon. Uh, not true with either young men attacking transformers with sniper rifles or other things happening. Um, this is a situation in which we are being very seriously challenged as a nation because it requires us to do something we're not used to doing. We're not used to thinking about the security of the homeland since really, I'd say, the few weeks after Pearl Harbor when we had uh, uh, Japanese submarines uh, off the East Coast and German submarines, uh, I mean German submarines on the East Coast, Japanese submarines uh, off the Pacific Coast, California. Um, Americans aren't used to thinking about attacks on us. Yeah, yeah, we had to think about nuclear war during the Cold War especially. That was sort of a cataclysm that ended everything. But to have somebody actually be planning to take out portions or a very substantial share of our electric grid is uh, a new thought. It is uh, not something that we are used to dealing with. It's not something we want to deal with. It's something that most people feel just somebody take care of this. It's crazy. But if you go to the Department of Energy, you'll find that they're doing a little bit of work on modular transformers. If you go to the military, you'll say they are doing some work because they have some experience, particularly with electromagnetic pulse, which I'll say a word about in a minute, but experience with protection and focusing seriously on, on that side of life. Um, but we uh, don't want to have to protect 
Metcalf, California from people with sniper rifles. That world we thought ended, say, in 1865, or at least in 1941, 42. And we're, uh, we're not ready. We're not organized to do it. If you go to the Department of Homeland Security and say, you guys are Homeland Security, what are you doing about the survivability of the electric grid? You tend to get a kind of deer in the headlights look. Basically, they're not doing much. They don't really think it's their job. They think maybe sort of kind of it's the military's job. The military's pretty strapped for money these days with sequestration and the rest. So there's not a lot of activity. There's not a lot of uh, attention being paid at the White House level or other senior levels of the government. It's just uh, something people are wringing their hands about. And um, if this were only something that we could deal with by putting up better protection against snipers and better cyber protections, which we're working on at least, that would be one thing. But there's another, and I'll close with this, there's another problem for the electric grid that probably is the toughest uh, of all. Uh, there is a phenomenon called the electromagnetic pulse, which um, is in the first instance not something that on a causative set of thinking any of us can do anything about because the actor is the sun. The sun creates every once in a while um, a, an electromagnetic pulse, a, a, a coronal ejection it's called, that is like a huge solar storm. And at a few times in the past, there have been events, solar events of such a size, one in 1859, that it would have essentially taken out all of the electronics in the world if we'd had many electronics beyond the few telegraphs that we had at the time. Um, it, uh, however, since then, and it periodically, also, the sun throws up somewhat smaller electromagnetic pulses, but those can be devastating. In uh, 1989, there was one that uh, occurred in solar terms very close to Quebec and effectively took out Quebec's electricity for a year. Uh, so there is this phenomenon of solar events that it doesn't matter whether we want to deal with it or not. There's no way to get away from it by saying, well, you say this, maybe the Russians or the North Koreans or somebody, but I'm not worried about the Russians and North Koreans. They're not going to do anything crazy. Get away and leave me alone. The problem with the solar electromagnetic pulse is that saying that to the sun doesn't do any good. The sun will do whatever it wants. And um, the situation one faces uh, is one in which that set of, of events could easily produce for us something like what happened to Quebec back in the late 80s. Um, that would mean if, if Quebec had occurred in New England, New York and Pennsylvania, uh, we, uh, as it did in Quebec in 89, uh, we would have been without electricity in a huge share of the United States for at least a year or so, maybe more. And what that means is huge problems with water, with food, with transportation, with f the financial world, with technology of all sorts, a stunning, stunning set of problems. The other thing, however, that can happen and that can give rise to electromagnetic pulse um, is 
human caused. And we know about this because in 1962, uh, at the very end of the period in which we could use detonations of nuclear weapons in testing in the atmosphere, both the Russians and Americans tested uh, essentially relatively simple um, uh, nuclear detonations up uh, Russia and East Asia, uh, we in the Pacific, and both of us found very substantial electromagnetic effects on electronics even those thousands of miles away from where the detonation occurs. By the way, for an electromagnetic pulse to take out electronics of the electric grid or whatever, it does not need to detonate on the ground. It should not. It does not need to be accurate. It doesn't need to be accurate at all. It just needs to be in something like a satellite detonated up a couple of hundred miles uh, above the center of an area that one wants to affect. And then the pulse, as it did uh, in 1962, for both the Russians and we, uh, takes out electronics in a relatively wide area. Uh, as I said, this doesn't need to be a sophisticated thing at all. It can be a very simple nuclear weapon with virtually no yield, and it, since it's not going to detonate on the Earth, no accuracy, simply satellite, old nuclear weapon in it, boom, and a very substantial share of the grid is, is gone. Um, this uh, set of phenomena, ironically, has various things that can be done to fix it and to keep it from affecting the electric grid the way it does. There are three types of electromagnetic pulses. One of them is very much like lightning and the same thing, you do the same thing to defend against that that you would do to protect a building from lightning strike. And the military is working hard on that and that, that's manageable. There's a second kind that is far more troubling that within line of sight, say the satellite with a nuclear weapon in it is detonated up about 40 kilometers. Whatever is within line of sight down below it, if it's a small computer, or uh, the computer in your car, the computer on your, your washing machine, all of the computers that we all live with all the time, um, that those can be taken out by a single blast of the EMP, but they can also be fixed before too long by replacements. It will take time and effort and money, a substantial amount of money, but that can also be done. What is the most troubling is the fact that one of the three electromagnetic pulses is the most powerful when it has a long run along an electric connection as in a transmission line. And it takes out, the pulse takes out all of the transformers on the transition, transmission line. So you are at that point, once that detonation occurs, if you haven't done something to defend against it beforehand, you are, uh, I don't need to be any more vivid than I have been already, you are in a new world and it's a hideous one. Um, this third type of electromagnetic pulse actually is not that expensive to build protections around, Faraday cages uh, and so forth. These, these things can be done. It's a few billion dollars for the country as a whole. For this most damaging, very long-legged, covering the whole country electromagnetic pulse, the price is about a billion dollars for the country. That is approximately three dollars per American consumer. That is deciding on your way into work in the morning to go ahead and just buy a tall cafe Americano 
for a couple of dollars instead of your Vente special. I have these things all the time, and I, uh, I uh, was trying to think of one of the funnier ones, but you know what I mean. Um, instead of a $5 cup of coffee, having a $2 cup of coffee, and you have paid your share of fixing that very important part of the electric grid. What we don't have is leadership to begin to deal with those kinds of issues. The technology is not the main problem. The likelihood of a North Korean or Chinese launch of a missile from a fishing boat off our coast to uh, produce uh, an electromagnetic pulse is probably slim, at least in the near term. The probability of a solar event may be much higher, and there's nothing we can do about it. We have to do something to defend against it. But these things technologically are, it's known how to deal with them. The expense is not huge. What we are not doing is paying attention as a country to what we need to do in order to deal with this kind of a threat to our entire way of life. I want to end on one at least partially optimistic note. I uh, think that uh, it uh, is important sometime when you have a minute, you're in a library or on your Kindle and can call up uh, Carl Sandburg's marvelous poem about the American people called The People Yes. Uh, it ends uh, as uh, follows. Uh, the people will live on. The people will live on. They will turn and turn and turn and go back to the earth for root holes. Man is a long time coming. Brother may yet line up with brother. And remember that this old anvil laughs at many broken hammers. What do we do about this as citizens? My own view is that we are most likely to see action at the state level. I've kind of given up on the federal government on this for the time being. Uh, they, they, they may wake up, but I haven't seen any, any signs of it. But I've talked to several state governors and a number of, of their staffs, along with uh, uh, several of other colleagues who are particularly interested in and concerned about this issue. And particularly once they understand how little money is really involved, a number of governors are willing to come together and work on this together. We're talking to people in the National Governors Conference and the rest. Um, and I think that with some governors will come also, uh, if we put this together right, um, some of the companies that uh, are in a position to understand how devastating this could be if we don't do something about it. Um, it's, um, uh, I think, manageable with some leadership, and so far the best thing I've seen is governors and uh, a few, not all, but a few of the utilities. Uh, it's uh, my friend Eric Toon, who was the head of ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for the Energy uh, Department, uh, parallel to DARPA and the Defense Department. Uh, Eric ran these numbers himself, and he's a vice provost, Duke, and a chemical engineer. He says that uh, the, whatever it is, about 2,500, 1,500 or so, utilities in the U.S. spend less on research and development annually than does the American dog food industry.
Now we have pretty healthy dogs, I guess, in the U.S., and maybe we're doing a good job of that. But if you leave, at least in my experience, business alone on this, they're not going to do much, but they might, a few of them are looking like they're beginning to respond to governors. And so I would, I would think that, that some business associations working together with, with some governors could, could help begin to get this going. Uh, I might be wrong. The qu question is who would I think is behind uh, Metcalf? It's a, it's a real crazy situation and, and a very difficult call. Uh, an investigation may well turn up uh, some kind of crazy renegade group of, of, of people who are responsive to, you know, neo-Nazi ideas or whatever. I, I don't know. But this didn't look ad hoc. It didn't look like people who were doing this for the first time. It didn't look to the Navy SEALs who looked at the film and so forth. It didn't look like people who were untrained. Uh, it looked like people who knew what they were doing, although weren't perfect. As I said, they didn't use armor-piercing rounds and so forth. Um, the, both the Navy SEALs and uh, uh, the sheriff of the county said it was about as clear to them that it was terrorism, planned terrorism, as, as they could think anything would be like this. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, you know, you look back at Waco and Oklahoma City and and so forth, we have crazy groups in this country and some of them have ties to organizations overseas and some do not. The American Electric Grid is kind of an organizational nightmare. Uh, the, you have investor-owned utilities, of course, and you also have municipal uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and some others, uh, uh, like agricultural co-ops and so on. It is very heavily divided up state by state in terms of the real regulatory authority and uh, added cost which would go into the rate base or sometimes paid for otherwise um, is uh, heavily resisted mainly by the utilities and by the governors and the, the, the uh, uh, state authorities. Um, it um, it has got to find someone who will stand up with, as I think as a governor, and explain how his state, her state, is going to be better off because they're taking certain action. Um, and I, uh, I can't, I don't imagine we're anything out of the federal government, at least for the next several years, maybe for longer than that. Uh, and business alone is not going to do this. But, but, but business with a governor or a group of governors through the governor's, uh, uh, National Governor Association and so forth, I think might. Can a state protect itself? Uh, it, the answer is kind of it depends on where the uh, uh, Areas are where there are are uh, you know a lot of uh, 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 transmission lines and and transformers. Um, there are about eight or ten states, most populous ones usually, that if you got the three or four or five major uh, organs or structures, let's say, of or collections of transformers, uh, you'd take out the rest of the country. And there are another three or four or five or six that it wouldn't take out much more than a single state. So it, it, it varies. And you, you see, you can find these things on the web. If you just look at a, a map uh, of where the, the uh, transformers are. Uh, and by the way, we haven't done squat to protect the information. Uh, dealing with these. Uh, one of the interconnects, which is one of the 
big organizations that, that deals with the buying and selling long distance electricity, among other things, had a, um, uh, uh, something happened a couple of years ago, uh, a Chinese individual, I don't know whether he's Chinese American or Chinese Chinese, uh, asked one of the big interconnects if he could come spend a few days or a week or two looking at their electric grid and how it was all put together and how it worked because he was doing some work in China. The guy who's the head of this interconnect uh, called the State Department got somebody who claimed to have something to do with China and asked and the person in the state said, oh sure, you know, he's Chinese and we want to be nice to the Chinese, so yeah, let him look at what he wants. And he went ahead and for some weeks drafted detailed maps of the East Coast uh, grid and uh, somebody over at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, found out about this and called the Chinese gentleman and said, uh, we understand you're working on electric grids, that's what we do too. We're interested in the progress you've made because uh, we might be able to do some things together. Would it be possible for you to come in and talk to us? And the guy said, sure, absolutely, glad to. Um, uh, how about uh, day after tomorrow? And uh, uh, they said, that's fine, we'll see you downtown office. And then uh, one day later, the day before, day after tomorrow, he flew back to Beijing. Um, so there is very little just common sense organizationally that is taking place with respect to discipline, security clearances, all of the kinds of things that you should want. Somebody has to be put in charge. I think probably given the importance, given the fact that they're taking it seriously and given the fact that Homeland Security is not taking it seriously, I would give it to the Pentagon because they at least get stuff done. Other countries are pretty well vulnerable in the same fashion. South Korea is very worried about a North Korean electromagnetic pulse shot and uh, they are uh, uh, working hard on ways to deal with uh, the threat. Um, the other people who have this capability uh, without a lot of extra effort are Russia, uh, uh, China, uh, uh, Iran is working on some elements of it, but don't have a nuclear weapon yet. Uh, but other aspects of it, other things you need, the Iranians are working on hard, and the Iranians and North Koreans work together on lots of things. Uh, so, um, in, but in terms of people who are concerned that they may be a target, uh, the only one I, uh, I know of is South Korea. Uh, it used to be more or less effective, but with respect to uh, electromagnetic pulse, I think they are not doing much and the uh, problem is that if you knock off the water going into a nuclear power plant for hours to days, uh, what happens is Fukushima. Uh, so um, one of the things that we have to worry about is our 104 nuclear reactors, most in the east but scattered around the country. Uh, because those are as much a source of chaos and catastrophe as uh, anything, uh, anything we've got. It, difference in behavior in the states uh, where uh, the governors and the governments have, have uh, seen things like Sandy or other uh, 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 serious uh, problems for the, for the grid given uh, uh, natural events. Um, I haven't yet, but we're just getting started with the governors, and uh, I would expect to. Uh, on the whole, the only group I've been uh, impressed with in this uh, sort of careening around talking to people about this and so forth, and talking to, to academics who know something about it and so on, it, it, it's the governors. That's what people tend to say. I tried to talk to so-and-so in DOE and they don't know a damn thing about this and they are scared to say anything about it. The governors generally say either tell me about it or so-and-so was by here last month and he took us part way into it. Uh, what are some of the other states doing? What, what could we do to work on this? So, you know, it's, uh, we, I hope this ends up being a marvelous justification for our federal system. Uh, and so far, the governors are about the only ones I find that are, are really
looking like they'd be doing something. What most smart grid work is, since the people who are doing it are software engineers and IT people usually, what it's mainly, not exclusively, but mainly about is apps. Everybody wants to come up with a new app. They want you to be able to use your cell phone to turn down the heat in your home uh, on a hot summer day and turn down the air I'm sorry, not the heat turn down the air conditioning so you don't waste a lot of electricity and to be able to do it as an app and that's what excites them and that's what most of them are working on um, and if you say you ought to be working on security you tend to get for many of them the kind of deer in the headlights of, hey, well, that's not my job. I, I, I create apps. Um, I was asked three or four years ago by uh, one of the laboratories, Sandia, to um, write a history of the electric grid uh, in 500 words and to do it in one day, uh, please, before the conference ended. So I, uh, remembering a couple of movies that have floated around, I came up with a situation whereby a group of eighth graders in Tarzana, California, um, were uh, at the beginning of the summer beginning to see the grid going down for one day first in Tarzana and then around the country, Cleveland, and then back up, and then in San Jose, down and back up. And there, nobody could figure out what was going on, but these eighth graders were giggling a, a lot. And finally, uh, one of them came into the police station and said he needed to talk to the police chief. And, and the sergeant on duty said, well, why is that, Timmy? And he said, well, my dad heard me and my friends talking about something and he told me I had to come and talk to the chief. Said, well, all right, come on in. Timmy, what, would you like a glass of water or anything? What, what, what's this about? And Timmy said, well, you know, he said, you know this business where the grid's been going down in a different town each day and then coming back the next day? He said, yeah, everybody's worried about it. We got national studies and teams and engineers and everything. And Timmy said, yeah, I, I know. Um, he said, that's us. He said, that's me and three of my friends. And he said, what happened is pretty straightforward, is that the video game issue that came out in early June, right when school was out, was really boring. I mean, my friends and I were through that within a day or two. It just it wasn't anything to it. And we didn't have anything to do for the summer, so we figured we'd take down the electric grid. And that's been us for the last uh, uh, two or three weeks. And, you know, we figured we weren't really going to hurt anybody if we just took it down for a day here and a day there. So that's what we've been doing. And he said, then what happened three days ago, and the reason this has all stopped, is the new issue of video games came out. And they are really hard. They are much harder than taking down the grid. So we decided we'd stop taking down the grid and we'd, we'd go back to the video games. And the chief was shaking by the sway of time. And he says, he says, uh, wha uh, what um, do you suggest we do? And the eighth grader said, well, he says, one thing you got to do. He said, you know, all you guys, you have these guys who are putting apps together and they call it a smart grid. He said, you don't have a smart grid. you got an ODAVD grid. And the chief is still shaking and he says, whoa, 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 what's ODAVD? And the eighth grader says, ostrich designed, awesomely vulnerable, dude. So, yeah, I mean, there's a smart grid and there are a few people working on it who I think have the right priorities and are focused on, on improving security and great. But most people who are working on it want apps and that's what they're thinking about and they when they hear smart grid they think I get to design a new app. DOE has gotten started on a modular transformer it's not real far, far along and it's not a big modular transformer it's a small one 
but they're at least working on the problem um, and have been for a year or so. I, I guess one of the things I might do is push that as fast as one can because when you're talking about a human attack, uh, it's limited number of people and uh, if you did have securely stored even a relatively small number of transformers, but they would have to be the big ones, uh, then you've got a, a pretty ready response once something happens. In the meantime, you can probably build resilience uh, uh, into the system, uh, uh, you know, a number of ways with uh, 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 reserve capabilities and Faraday cages and that kind of thing that can be put in if something is damaged. I think not only spares and so on, but better defensive systems, uh, highway patrol more briefed and ready to, you know, check places all the time. Uh, but, uh, and this is the kind of thing you want to be able, however politically incorrect it may be, to infiltrate organizations that might be involved in doing something like this. Uh, and I would say if anybody asks how you do that, I'd say go talk to Ray Kelly, the police chief, former I guess now, in uh, New York, who uh, he and uh, David Cohen, his deputy, who uh, used to work for me at the CIA, uh, did as good a job as I think anybody in the country has done in figuring out how to do that without treading on people's civil liberties. I guess I'd go get Ray Kelly out of retirement and bring David Cohen in and start figuring out how to get inside the skin of uh, uh, people who might do this. Thank you.